what a privilege it is to worship thee, the living God. As angels said over thee in the courts above, thank you for giving us this privilege to come to thy footstool and to worship you. I pray that you will pour your spirit upon us and please touch the lips of thy servant that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart might be acceptable in thy sight, O God, my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. How beautiful it is to come to the house of God, amen? amen. What an experience it is to be here. I know many are worshiping with us online, but there is nothing like coming to the house of God. So if you're in the area, make an attempt to be here because the Lord is in his holy temple, amen? amen? But God bless you wherever you are. God knows the situation. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Well, uh, this morning we have a very important topic to study together from God's word. The second coming, three different attitudes. Now, we all have different names, but as believers in the Lord Jesus, as people of prophecy, we have one name. We are called Adventist because we are waiting for the advent of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Second coming, three different attitudes. Now, what is an attitude. Attitude matters in life because attitude is defined as a settled way of thinking that is reflected typically in our characters, in our behavior. So how a person thinks, that's what he is. You become what you think. So an attitude is a settled way of thinking. It's not just a passing thought. You have settled in a particular thought, and that is reflected in your behavior and ultimately in your character. The second coming is the greatest news. It's the greatest event the world will ever experience. It is the blessed hope of God's people. And as this message goes to the whole world, as Christ promised, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all nations as a witness. And then the end will come. Not that everybody is going to believe. Most of them will not. But as the message goes that Jesus is coming back, this world will end. He's coming to judge the living and the dead. There are going to be reactions from people. Most will not believe it. And they will mock at those who believe it. But there are Christians who believe in the coming of the Lord. You know, I grew up as a Catholic. I never knew Jesus was coming back. But we have the liturgies that we say in the church, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ is coming again. Every Sunday we used to say that. But it never dawned on me that Christ is coming because they never preached on the second coming. Most of the Christians believe the Lord will come, but they are not anticipating, they're not preparing for it. And yet there is another group of people that believes wholeheartedly and prepares for the coming of the Lord. I have categorized the world into three categories. Number one, the world's attitude to the coming of Jesus. Number two, the nominal Christian's attitude, namesake Christians. And number three, the believer's attitude. May the Holy Spirit speak to each one of us this morning and help us realize where we are and what is our attitude to the greatest event. And if we are not in the right group, may God help us to change before it's too late. 
We will first look at the world's attitude. Apostle Peter talked about the people of the world, how they're going to react to the second coming doctrine. He said in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, knowing this first, that they shall come in the last days. Who? Scoffers. Walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Who are scoffers? They are mockers. They ridicule those who are preaching that Jesus is coming and they question us saying, where is the promise of his coming? He said he's coming, right? 2,000 years have passed. All things are going the same way. That's what they think. But a student of prophecy knows it is going exactly as predicted. And these are also one of the signs, those who question that. Doctrine. Jesus, Peter said, in the last day such people will arise. So when you hear the scoffers, you should know for sure the Lord is coming. These are the last days. Now, why they question this? It's not because it's an unbelievable event. For God, this is nothing. They don't want this event to happen because it's going to be a day of judgment. And they don't want to face the judge. They don't want to face their own life's record. The secret things will be revealed. They want to still do things in darkness. And therefore, they dismiss this idea and they mock at those who believe that the Lord is coming back. Yes, beloved, this kind of sinful lifestyle and this kind of attitude is not new for the last days. Long ago, during the time of Noah, the world had the same kind of lifestyle and same kind of attitude. God destroyed the world then by water. And he has promised to destroy this world again by fire. And Jesus himself said in Luke 17, 26 and 27, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, and were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Jesus talked about Noah's days and made a comparison. Interestingly, Christ talks about what they were doing on a daily basis, eating, drinking, marrying. But if you go to the days of Noah, as recorded in Genesis, you, would, you see it was a wicked world, a terrible world. The Bible tells us in Genesis 6 and verse 11, the earth was corrupt, the earth itself, before God. And the earth was filled with violence. If we are talking about the gun problem here and the shooting, I don't know whether they had guns then, but they were surely killing each other. The earth was filled with violence. And it says in verse, uh, I think verse 6 or somewhere there, the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continuously. And the scripture says it repented God that he made man on this earth. But there was one man who was walking righteously with God. Of course, there were a few other people there, but one family finally survived the flood. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be when I come. Interestingly, Jesus doesn't talk about all the corruption and violence he said, days of Noah, eating, drinking, marrying. <clears throat> no, nothing wrong in eating and drinking and marrying. We all do that. 
In fact, God gave those blessings to mankind. In the Garden of Eden, he said, of all the trees of the garden, you may freely eat, except one. And there was the river that flowed out of the garden. They could drink of that. And he said, it is not good for man to be alone. He instituted marriage. But what was the problem with these three things during the time of Noah? They were eating not to live, but they were living to eat. And also, they were drinking what God did not permit and marrying beyond the guidelines of God's word, the oral word. And so they disregarded the commands of God. And you see, in the last days, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it'll be before the Son of Man comes. Paul said in Philippians 3 and verse 19, whose God is their belly. You know, God has to be in our hearts. The God is in a wrong place here. God, their God is their belly. What does it mean? It means they are only concerned about food, about survival in this world. They're studying and working and doing everything just for this life. Their God is their belly. They're not concerned about their heart. God said, my son, my daughter, give me your heart. He's standing at the door of our hearts and knocking. Because out of the heart are the issues of life. But their God is their belly. They're just working for this life. Don't you see people of this world? They're just concerned about this life. They have forgotten completely about a greater life that God is offering. And Jesus said in Luke 21, 34, and take heed to yourself. He's telling the disciples, he's telling the Christians, he says, be careful on this point. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. That that day, the coming of Jesus, should overtake you, should come upon you unawares. Jesus said, be careful of one thing. Surfeiting is overindulgence. Isn't intemperance a major problem today? Eating the wrong thing and overeating the right things? He says, take heed of these things about the cares of this life. Now, nothing wrong about this life. God has given all of us this life. But the problem is, if we just think about this life so much that we forget eternal life, then the good things of this life becomes bad when we forget something better. He says, take heed that you're not trapped so much engrossed about what you do, how you survive, how your children will, you know, live, that that day comes upon you unaware because you're so engrossed about the cares of this life. Didn't Noah preach for 120 years? The flood is coming. Probably first year when he preached... You know, he had a big crowd coming there and said, wow, two years passed, 10 years passed, 20, 50, 100 years passed, nothing has happened. He's talking about a worldwide flood. It never rained till that point of time, and he's talking about a flood. They called the scientists and philosophers of their days, and they studied nature and said, this is contrary to science and nature. This man must be crazy. And finally, Noah was right because he spoke the word of God. What is impossible with man is possible with God. You don't limit the God of nature to nature. 
He is above all of it. He is in absolute control. The problem with man is, there is a, see, a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. God is always right. He said, your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. And finally the flood came. And they found out too late that Noah was right. What a tragedy. They couldn't do anything. Jesus says, they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. How come they did not know when Noah preached for 120 years? They had years, but did not hear. Eyes they had, but could not see. And so when it happened, they said, what? As if they never heard. As in the parable, Jesus said, you know, the sower went to sow. Some seeds fell by the wayside, and then the birds came and took the seed away. The evil one is the bird. They heard it, but since they did not pay heed to the word, the devil plucked that seed away. And it came as a big surprise that the flood has finally come. And so shall also this coming of the Son of Man be. The gospel goes to the whole world. Everyone will hear. But when it happens, they said, what? They have ears but cannot hear. Because they are so engrossed with the things of this world. And as the gospel goes, people mock and laugh and ridicule. And finally... It happens, and see how they react. Jesus himself said, And then shall the sign of the Son of Man appear in heaven, and then all shall all the tribes of the earth do what? Mourn. They mocked when they heard. Now when they see, they mourn. It's too late. Nothing can be done. Probation has closed. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. You know, people in Noah's days, finally when the flood came, they tried their level best to break open, but they could not. Angels of God were protecting the ark. And they had to now go to higher ground. They climbed the huge Lebanon trees, cedars of Lebanon. And the waters were surging higher and higher. They climbed the mountains. But the waters kept increasing for 150 days from underneath and the water from heaven for 40 days. And man, you know, those days, Bible says in Genesis 6 that there were giants in the earth in those days. And we are told in the pen of inspiration they were more than twice our size, 15 feet something. Can you imagine those big men? And they finally went to the mountaintop and man and beast, we are told in patriarchs and prophets, they were fighting for a common place because even animals were getting destroyed, those who were not in the ark. They were pushing each other. But finally, the waters got everybody. They went to the mountains, hoping to survive the coming judgment, the judgment that was coming upon them. And how it will be at the second coming, same thing, same lifestyle, same attitude. And same way they're going to react. These are also on mountaintops. Revelation 6, 16 and 17. They said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fallen us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Mountains and rocks. They go to the mountains and rocks. They should have gone to Jesus, the rock of ages. You know, if you don't go to that rock, you'll go to another rock. And now we will look at the nominal Christian's attitude. I'm sure none of us will fall in the first category. The very fact that we are here and worshiping online, it means we are not in the first group. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. But you could be in the second group. So you and I have to be extremely careful 
not to be in this second group. The nominal Christian's attitude. You know, the worldly scoffer denies the coming of the Lord altogether, but the Christian believes in the coming of the Lord, but doesn't believe it's imminent. He believes it will take place someday, and therefore, he or she is not preparing for the coming of Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verses 48 and 49, that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. What's the problem? He's a servant. He's a Christian. But he's not a faithful servant. He's an evil servant. He's an evil servant. And what is he saying? My Lord delayeth his coming. And notice, he's not speaking this loudly. He's saying it where? In his heart. But in his mouth, he's singing, Coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. But not now. <laughs> not in my time. In his heart, he says, My Lord delayeth his coming. So when you have that attitude, you're not preparing. I remember when I became an Adventist in when I joined this church from the Catholic Church, I got baptized May 1991. And I was so excited that Jesus is coming. I never heard this doctrine before. And I went to the conference office in Bangalore. And I met one of the directors there. I'm not going to name the director, neither the department. I met the director there and I said, I believe Jesus is coming soon. You know, I want to spread this news to everybody. I was so excited. I was a new Adventist. The man almost put cold water on me. <laughs> he said, brother, when I was your age, I was like you. I used to even pray for a little glass of water, not just for the meal. I said, wow, really religious. And he told me, nothing has happened. Everything is going as it is. And he told me, I'm telling you, Jesus will not come for the next 500 years. And I'm thinking, why did I join this church? 500 years, I should have been there. But thank God, God kept me still here. Because I didn't want to lose my focus of Jesus. It doesn't matter when he comes. That's not my problem. The day and the hour, he knows. But today is given to me. I may not live for tomorrow, so... That's it. I don't need to be alive till he comes. My Lord delayeth his coming. And when you have that kind of attitude, he begins to smite his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards. Who are these? The same first group. Eating and drinking and marrying, doing everything. Even the servant is doing the same thing. What is the difference? One doesn't believe the Lord is coming. Other one says he's not coming now. That's all. Lifestyle is the same thing. Eating and drinking and marrying. Isaiah in prophecy saw the second group of people, nominal Christians. And he told us beautifully in prophetic picture about their attitude and the outcome. Isaiah 4 verse 1. In that day, last days, seven women shall take hold of one man. A woman in prophecy represents church and seven represents all churches. So he's talking about the, all the churches of the last days. The one man is Jesus Christ, the bridegroom of the church. And they are telling him, we will eat our own bread. And we will wear our own apparel. But let us only be called by thy name to take away our reproach. 
They said, we don't want your word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. They say to him, we don't want your word. Our word is good enough to rule our life. We'll believe our own doctrines. I will have our own teachings. We don't want your apparel. We will wear our own apparel. We don't want your righteousness to cover us. We are good enough with fig leaves. But only one thing we want from you, we want your name. You are Christ. We want to be called Christians. But we will do what we want. Just give us your name. Wow. Most of the Christian churches, most of the Christians are namesake Christians. Jesus called them lip Christians. He said in Matthew 15, 8 and 9, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for the doctrines and commandments of men, they draw near to God only from the mouth and from their lips, but their heart, not with Jesus. They worship him, but he says vain worship, because this is Cain kind of worship. Cain worship is vain worship. He came to worship God in his own terms, and he says sorry. Most of the Christians in the last days, you and I need to be careful. We could be in this category. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 5, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You know, Christianity is powerful. Amen. These have the form of godliness. They don't have God. They just have the form of godliness. Outward, everything seems to be nice. You know, sometimes we could be in this group. We could be in danger of having just a form of godliness. Having all the programs meticulously carried out week after week, Sabbath after Sabbath. But if your heart is not there in what you are doing, in what I am doing, it's vain worship. We could be giving our tithes and offerings, but what God loves is a cheerful giver. If your heart is not there in giving, if your heart is not there in your singing, if your heart is not there in your preaching, if your heart is not there in your prayer, if your heart is not there in anything that you do, it is vain worship. What matters is not a lip service, a heart service. Amen. To love the Lord our God, the first commandment, is with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. I mean, we all love God, but the problem is, do we love Him with all our heart? As Sister White says, Jesus is the Lord of all or Lord not at all. He doesn't occupy a divided heart. Denying the power thereof. As Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit is come upon you, you shall receive power. You know why many times we lack power? Because the Spirit is absent. Because if He is there, it's powerful. It's powerful. Matthew 7, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus should not just be the Lord of our mouth, he should be the Lord of our lives. Amen. We should be doing His will and not just calling Him 
Lord. Jesus illustrated this in a beautiful parable where Christians, majority of them, fall in this category. He said in Luke 14, 16 and 17, Then said he unto them, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And look at how they respond, verses 18 to 20. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought me a piece of ground. I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Now, if you look at these excuses, they're not bad excuses. Good excuses. What's wrong in buying a piece of ground? Nothing wrong. What's wrong with uh, buying five yoke of, of oxen or in our context today doing business? Nothing wrong. What's wrong with marrying? Nothing wrong. But right can be wrong when you get your priorities wrong. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If you don't get that first, then even the good becomes bad. So these are not bad people. They only got their priorities wrong. That's the danger that you and I face today. And look at the Lord's response. I say unto you that none of those men who were bidden shall taste of my supper. None. We need to be careful right in God's true church. There are two groups of people, the wise and the foolish virgins, waiting for the bridegroom to come. What was the problem with these foolish virgins? They were not bad people. They were in the right group, waiting for the right event. They had the lamps as well. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. They had even oil to start with. All of them had oil initially. All the lamps were burning. But the oil ran out at some point of time. They started well. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. Endurance was not there. They did not persist with the right. And they ran out of oil finally. And so they go to the wise later and they tell, the foolish say unto the wise, give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. You know, initially when I read this parable, I thought, you know, the, the wise virgin should have at least shared some oil and got them in. But oil represents the Holy Spirit. And Ellen White says it's the Holy Spirit that helps us to form holy characters. And character cannot be transferred. Each one have to work out their own salvation in fear and trembling. Noah, Job, and Daniel, as Ezekiel, what, 14, 20 says, if they were there, they cannot save their son and their daughter by their righteousness. They can save their own selves. I cannot save my wife or my son. Neither can they save me. Salvation is individual. Character cannot be formed overnight. Sanctification is a lifelong process. So last minute we cannot be jumping here and there. It has to be on a daily basis. Changing our lives and getting ready for the greatest event ever. 
Yes, the nominal Christians, they were doing a lot of things. In Matthew 7, they said, Lord, in thy name we cast out devils. In thy name we have done many wonderful works. And what did he say? They said unto him, Lord, Lord. And they gave a big list of what they were doing. And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Depart. And then you have the foolish virgins. He doesn't uh, rebuke them so badly as he did the first group. They also say the same thing. Lord, Lord, open to us. But he said, verily I say unto you, I know you not. The oil was missing. And he that hath not the spirit of Christ is none of his. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, I suppose. The oil was missing. Do you have oil in your lamps? Or is it just a form of godliness that we come week after week and then go back, live the same way, and come here and hoping we'll make it to the kingdom. Beloved, may God help us to see our own lives. We have to pray every day. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. For our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm not my own, I'm bought with a price. And every day we have to pray for the Spirit and for the latter rain. Because it's not by might, it's not by power, but it is by my Spirit, saith the Lord. And finally, I hope I would be in this group. I hope each one of us here seated and the ones worshipping with us via live broadcast would be in this category, the believer's attitude. You see, they are praying every day as John captured the essence of a true Christian. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. They are not saying in their heart, my Lord delayeth is coming. They see the signs, they know it is imminent. We don't know when, but we know it is near, even at the door. And they're praying, Lord, come soon. We are tired of what is happening in the world. We are tired of the sins that are happening in the church. We are tired of the sins of our own lives. Change me, O oh Lord. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. They are praying for the second coming. And not only that, they are also looking for the second coming to take place. Hebrews 9, 28. Them that look for him shall he appear the second time. Are you looking for the second coming? Are you praying for the second coming? We need to pray every day, beloved. Lord, please hasten your coming. I want to go home. Not only they are praying and looking, they are also sharing the news to everybody that they know that Jesus is coming again. Philippians 3.20, our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. When they meet their colleagues, their friends, they somehow pass the news that Jesus is coming. Think about it. When has it been the last time that you sincerely prayed in your heart for the Lord to come? And when have you sincerely been looking for the Lord to come? And when you last shared with somebody that Jesus is coming back? 
It's not for anybody here to judge each other, but for us to inspect our own lives. Amen? Their conversation is in heaven. It's about Jesus' second coming. And not only they do all these three, they make preparations for the coming as well. It says in Revelation 19, 7 and 8, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. She'll be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. If you, have be, if, you, if you and I have to be a part of that group, our lives have to be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing by His grace. They have made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Christ's righteousness has become their righteousness. The imparted righteousness of Jesus. It's not like the other seven women who said we will wear our own apparel. They have the clothing of Christ. The character of Christ is their character. Beloved, the message comes to us once again this afternoon. That message that is so important and so urgent. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Israel is the church. The world will mock. They will laugh. But you and I have to prepare to meet the king. Soon and very soon, he is coming. Whether we like it or not, whether people believe it or not, he's coming. He is coming. Heaven and earth can pass away. And when he comes the second time, uh, he is going to have words of commendation for you and me if we are faithful. Matthew 25, 30 to 23, the Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. Not an evil servant, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Don't you want to hear, well done? Wow. One group will say to the mountains and rocks, fallen and hide us from his face. Another group will say, Lord, Lord. And he will say, I never knew you. But the third group will say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is our God. We have waited for him. We'll be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Amen? Amen. Is that your hope? Yes, there is going to be the world's attitude, and we don't want that for sure. There is going to be the nominal Christian's attitude. We don't want that for sure. We want the believer's attitude. Amen? Amen. That should be our attitude, beloved. Very soon the eastern sky is going to burst open. And the Lord is going to come with his millions of angels. What a grand event. The blessed hope of the church, the blessed hope of the world will be a reality soon and very soon. But we need to hear words of commendation from the Lord. You have been faithful. Oh, brother, be faithful. Soon Jesus will come. Oh, sister, be faithful. Soon Jesus will come for whom we have waited so long. It's high time if we are not in that believer's category. It's high time to make changes, for today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow might be too late. Second coming, three different attitudes. What is your attitude? May God help us to have the right attitude so that we can be ready for the right and greatest event ever. Amen.
Amen. In response to that inspiring message, please stand as we sing hymn number 602. O brother, be faithful. Jesus is coming back. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but never God's word. O oh Lord, we pray that we would be having the right attitude today so that we can be ready for the greatest event ever that is soon to transpire. Help us not like the foolish virgins at the last minute to look for the oil. Oh, my Father, I pray that every day each one of us would be on our knees crying to the Lord for the oil of the Holy Spirit to change us, to fill us, 
and to use us for your glory. O Lord, we know whatever we do is worthless unless we have the unction of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, Lord, be pleased to come into our hearts and change us. I pray that none of us would be missing that day and use us all for thy glory. Bless this church, bless the members, our friends here, and who have worshipped with us online. You know our needs, Lord, meet all of them. For your glory alone, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, and thank you so much for worshiping with us here at the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's been our pleasure to worship with you wherever you may be tuning in from. Thank you so much for being part of our family. I hope you are blessed by Pastor Michael Pedrin's sermon today. The three attitudes, what he talked about. You know, in our lives, we're going to be meeting many different kinds of people, many different people that we're to minister to. And we may be part of one of those three groups. It's my hope and prayer that as we work towards winning as many souls for Jesus, that we'll be part of that third group. Those who are faithful, those who are waiting, those who are eager for the Lord's second coming. After all, we are Seventh-day Adventists, looking forward to the second advent of Jesus Christ. May we keep our focus on that. May everything that we do have that goal in mind. And may we never forget it, even though it may seem like Jesus is not coming anytime soon. Maybe your grandparents said it, maybe your parents said it, and now we're wondering when is Jesus coming? But the signs of the times show us that His coming is very soon. And like Pastor Michael said, let's not plan for 500 years from now because we don't know what will happen even tomorrow. All we know is that we have today. Let us do everything we can to embrace that hope today. May we remember it in our hearts constantly because that is the goal. If you've been blessed by the ministry here at the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church, I would encourage you to please keep us in your prayers. Please support us as you tune in live. I see your comments in the chat. It's what a blessing it is to see everyone interacting and know that there's a church family, not just here, but around the world. We're all one body in Christ, worshiping together. And if you are so inspired to do so, we much greatly appreciate your financial gifts to the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church. I know the media team is constantly trying to improve the way that we interact with you, our brothers and sisters from different parts of the world, whether you're down the street or in a different part of the world, other side of the country, who knows? But we're constantly trying to interact greater and better with you. You can do so online or send your financial gifts in. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, dismissing you with His blessing but never from his presence. Have a happy Sabbath and see you at 5 p.m. for prayer and praise.